Okay, so thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come here today. I'm really excited about being here. Uh, I've been to Paris many times before, but this is my first visit to the IPGP. Um, and uh, already here t this morning at the breakfast with the students and postdocs, we had some really lively discussions. And I think this was very good because I come from an astrophysics background and I realize a lot of people here come more from geochemistry or, or geology backgrounds. But I think actually that we have a lot in common. I'm interested in how planets form from a, from a physics point of view and I understand a lot of people here are interested in various aspects of how the Earth works and how the solar system uh, 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 works. And I hope with this talk today that I can reach out to all of you and make you all excited about planet formation and, and I hope also that we can that you can see some connections to the research which you're doing and I'll be happy to take any questions about that afterwards or also at, at the at the buffet okay so I am going to talk about the formation of planets around young stars and, and indeed as was as was hinted at here in the introduction uh, it is a very exciting time now where we can actually observe the formation of planets around other stars directly so this is particularly done with something called the the Alma telescopes in Chile they observe the uh, since uh, 2013, they observed the universe at millimeter wavelengths. And when you point the ALMA telescopes at a young star, so a star that's only a few million years old, you will see something like this or like this. These are the first two images of young stars done, uh, taken with the ALMA telescopes. Now, what you see here is not the star at all, since this is at millimeter wavelengths. The star has almost no uh, emission at those wavelengths. Uh, quite on the contrary, what you see here is the dust surrounding these, these young stars. Here's HL Tau, 140 parsecs away, a million years old. This is TW Hydra, uh, it's so 54 parsecs away and 10 million years old. Uh, and what you see is this 100 AU, so this is an, uh, 10 AU, 10 astronomical units. You see these 100 AU disks that are orbiting the uh, stars. And the emission there is actually the uh, radiation from the star that has been absorbed by dust orbiting around the, 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 the young star. And then it's been re-emitted at thermal wavelengths, so the dust is heated to maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 Kelvin, and then it re-emits at thermal wavelength, which is, is uh, millimeters. You don't see the gas at all. Uh, the opacity is dominated by millimeter-sized pebbles at millimeter-sized wavelengths. There is 99% gas in here, which we don't see. Uh, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen is invisible at those temperatures. It doesn't absorb, it doesn't emit. But the dust has an enormous uh, opacity for absorbing uh, radiation and for re-emitting it again. Okay, so what do we learn from these kind of observations? Oh, first of all, I should say these are just the first two images that they've done. There was a large survey published this year called D-Sharp, and it's such a unique name. If you search for D-Sharp on Google, on Archive, you can find a lot of images of other young stars and protoplanetary disks. Okay, but what do we learn from observing young uh, stars with disks? Well, first of all, we see that there are dark rings in basically all of them. People think that these may be planets that are formed, that are starting to clear away the material uh, away. We're not entirely sure yet, uh, but it may be that it's planets. But one thing that we learn for absolutely certain is that there are pebbles in these disks. And this is special because uh, these, uh, in, in the interstellar medium, uh, uh, dust particles are generally micrometers in, in size. But what we see here are actually more particles that are grown to a millimeter in size. So we're seeing the first step of planet formation. Then you might be wondering, how can we see millimeter-sized uh, pebbles uh, at several parsecs away? We obviously can't photograph them directly, but we can actually analyze the light from the protoplanetary disk, and then you can say something about the characteristic particle size. If you analyze the emission of, uh, from the protoplanetary disk, then you can measure the opacity, so the square meters per kilogram of material, uh, and how that depends on the frequency of the light, uh, and you assume that it depends on some kind of power law. Now, if the opacity is independent of the light frequency, beta is zero, then these are large grains. Large grains are absorbing everything that comes near them. Uh, they absorb everything that has a shorter wavelength. So then, uh, then you will see an opacity index of zero, whereas if the grains are like in the interstellar medium, are micrometers in size, then you will see a beta parameter of about 1.7. So these are two uh, resolved measurements of the opacity index beta as a function of distance from the, from the star for two young protoplanetary disks. And you see in the outer part, you start this 1.7 value. And when, when you come closer to the star, it approaches something less than 0.5. And this is telling you that there are particles there that are typically millimeter size in the outer disk and centimeter in the inner disk. This is uh, the beta parameter translated into a maximum particle size. And you see here, as a function of the, of the di distance, the maximum grain size is in both cases sort of a millimeter in the outer part and going up to a centimeter in the inner part. Uh, we understand this uh, from the growth from dust grains to pebbles by coagulation of small dust grains into larger particles. 
Uh, and overall, uh, observing all young protoplanetary disks, we see that they all contain pebbles. So protoplanetary disks are at least very good at converting ISM dust into pebbles. But we don't want to stop there. We want to make planets. Uh, we can't really observe anything larger than a pebble. Then the, uh, the emitting surface gets too small. Uh, uh, so then we have to make theories to understand what, how these pebbles then somehow grow into planetary systems. Uh, so this planet formation process takes us from micrometer-sized dust, like this uh, IDP here, all the way up to planet-sized uh, uh, objects. So it's a process that goes up in size and, 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 and increases with time over, over a few million years. Uh, uh, in protoplanetary disk around young stars, dust grains collide and grow to ever larger bodies. So the first step is that dust grows to pebbles by coagulation and also by ice condensation. I will come back to that also. Then you end up with these millimeter, centimeter sized pebbles and then they concentrate into dense clumps and, and contract to form planetesimals like uh, the asteroid Lutetia here is a planetesimal in the solar system that has been left over here since planet formation. And finally, the planetesimals come together with more pebbles uh, and gas even and, and form both terrestrial planets like this Earth here and also form gas giants. And gas giants are like terrestrial planets, but they manage to accrete a lot of gas. Okay. But if we now go and dive into the first stage of planet formation here, so I, I have two parts to my talk. Uh, one is about the first stage from dust to planetesimals, and the other part is about from planetesimals to planets. But let's start by looking at the first stage here. How do we get the dust to grow into planetesimals? Now, a very, very important process that happens in protoplanetary disk is radial drift. Dust grains and pebbles don't stay put. They drift towards the central star. And the reason they do that is that there is a pressure of the gas in the protoplanetary disk that makes the gas move a little bit slower than the, than the Keplerian speed. Let me illustrate it here. This is just a sketch of a protoplanetary disk. Here is a star. There's gas around the disk. Here's a piece of gas here. here here's a single pebble. If you look at a piece of gas here, then it, it has two forces acting on it. One is the gravity towards the star that will make the gas orbit Keplerian at the Keplerian speed if it's in, if it's in centrifugal equilibrium. The other force is the pressure gradient force, since the gas is hotter and denser close to the star and uh, colder and less dense further away from the star, the gas wants to move from high pressure to low pressure. So there's an additional force, uh, the pressure gradient force, that pushes the gas out. Now this force goes in the opposite direction of the gravity, and if you add the two, it acts together as a little bit weaker gravity. So the, 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 the gas is feeling a little bit weaker to, uh, 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 total force, and that makes it orbit not at the Keplerian speed, but a little bit slower multiplied by 1 minus eta, where eta is a small parameter on the order of 10 to minus 3. Yeah? So the gas orbits slower, or the gas orbits sub-Keplerian or slower than the Keplerian speed. Now, if you are a, uh, a dust pebble out here, uh, you feel only the gravity, you don't feel the pressure gradient, it's too heavy. So this dust pebble would like to orbit at the Keplerian speed, but then the gas comes in with a speed that's slower than that by 30, 40, 50, 50 meters per second, and it's a bit like riding your bike in, in the wind, where you are, you are getting slowed down. And when, when the dust particle or pebble gets slowed down in an orbit around the star, it spirals in, in, into the star. And this is what we call radial drift. This was uh, formulated by Weidenschilling in 1977. And you see a plot here, a calculation of, as a function of the particle size in meters here, what is the drift speed towards the, the star. And you can see when you start with small particles, they don't drift so fast, they're basically just coupled to the gas. So they, don't, they just move together with the gas. If you go to large particles, they don't drift so fast because they don't notice the gas. But the worst thing is being around 10 centimeters in size or something when you drift at something like 50 meters per, per, per second. So this radial drift is a real issue for planet formation because it means that when you grow up to a certain size, you start to drift towards the star really, 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 really quickly. Now, the radial drift actually sets a natural maximum scale to what you can grow to by pure coagulation. And I can illustrate that here uh, in a plot uh, that shows here the, this is from a, a review paper by Bienstiel in 2016. It's a plot that shows the distance from the star here. It here shows the, pack, the particle size. And then I plot two arrows here. One arrow is pointing up, uh, which is the pebble growth rate. This is the radius growth rate divided by the radius. And another arrow is pointing to the left. That's the blue arrow here. This is the radial drift rate, uh, which is the, the rate of change of the semi-major axis divided by the semi-major axis. If I zoom in here, then I can illustrate a little bit to you what's going on here. Yeah. So in the beginning, we start here with micrometer-sized particles uh, at different locations. And if you start here at a few AU, you see in the beginning, we only have an arrow pointing up. That means that there's a high growth rate and there's no arrow pointing to the left. That means that there's almost no radio drift rate. 
It means that the particle is growing now in situ by coagulating with, with other particles. But as you see, as it's growing up and becoming larger and larger, you get more and more of an arrow pointing to the left. That means that the radial drift becomes now stronger and stronger when you start to approach a size of a millimeter or a few centimeters. At some point, these two arrows are equally long and you get the, the, the combined arrow becomes 45 degrees. And that means that you drift as fast as you're growing. And that means you can't really reach any larger size since you're drifting away from your growth region before you have a time to grow more. So you see, if you then integrate this vector map along 1 AU, 10 AU, 100 AU, at 1 AU, you see the particle growing, 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 growing and migrating, and at 10 AU, growing, 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 up to a millimeter, growing and migrating. They all end up on this black line, which is the maximum size you can grow to because the radial drift is keeping on moving you towards uh, uh, shorter distances from, from the uh, star. Yeah. So this is called the radial drift barrier or the drift-limited pepper growth. And you can see with this, you get sort of centimeter-sized particles in the inner disk and millimeter in the outer disk. It agrees very well with what we observe around, uh, around young stars. So we think probably the growth of particles is limited either by radial drift, which is the maximum size, but it can also be limited by bouncing. It means that you, that you simply don't stick when you collide together, you bounce off each other. Or even when you have high uh, collision speeds, it can be limited by fragmentation. But both of these processes here that are not included here just make smaller particles. So the radial drift barrier here, the black line, is sort of the maximum which you can grow to. Yeah. Illustrating here a, uh, an actual calculation of dust growth in protoplanetary disks, where we see that after some time, uh, so the blue colors here are showing uh, where most of the particles have, what size most of the particles have. So, uh, so you see that here in the outer disk, you're growing up to, uh, to a few millimeters maybe, and in the inner disk, you're growing up to a few centimeters. And you see two barriers here. One is the radial drift barrier, that is this barrier here. That is what you grow up to in the outer part. And in the inner part, you become smaller because that's a fragmentation barrier here, which is smaller than the radial drift barrier. So you could sort of say that dust particles grow to the smallest of the bouncing barrier or the radial drift barrier or the fragmentation barrier. And there's a pretty good agreement then between simple theory, uh, complicated uh, simulations and, and, and observations. So we sort of understand why we observe pebbles in protoplanetary disks, but, uh, it's, which is good, but it's disappointing from a point of view that we want to form planets and we don't really go beyond a few, uh, a few centimeters here. So we need some kind of help, maybe from gravity to form planetesimals. We need somehow these pebbles to come together to form uh, to form planetismals that are like asteroids, okay? So in order for gravity for pebbles to become important, we need to, co to collect them first in the gas. The gravity between two pebbles is completely insignificant, uh, but if we can collect a lot of pebbles close to each other by some mechanism, then the gravity can take over and force the pebbles to come together to form planetismals. So many theories have been proposed for concentrating particles in gas. That's what you need first before gravity becomes important. And if you want to read more about the various theories that have been proposed, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a review pa paper published in 2014, which one can find here on, on, on archive. But broadly, the mechanisms for concentrating particles can be divided into, into three categories, which I'm illustrating here. One is, a, is a, something proposed by Jeff Cousy in the early 2000s, is that on the very smallest scales of the turbulent flow, around a one kilometer size scale, then particles with Stokes numbers 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 4, and I'm not going to explain to you what a sort of Stokes number is, because just say it's proportional to the particle size, and these are sort of 10 micron to 100 micrometer size particles, that they can become concentrated in between turbulent eddies that are on the very smallest scales of, of the turbulent flow. Uh, this is a very robust mechanism. The problem is that the total mass you concentrate in between these eddies is very small, so it's hard to see how you could form asteroids out of that mechanism. On the other hand, if you go to the largest scale of the protoplanetary disk, so this is now what I call 1 to 10 scale heights, that's sort of almost the size of the protoplanetary disk, then the Coriolis force starts to be important. It's a rotating disk. And then you can form geostrophic structures that are similar to Earth low pressures and high pressures on Earth. In this case, I have illustrated a pressure bump here that is in balance between the uh, pressure gradient is pushing away from the center here and the pressure gradient on the inside mimics a, a higher gravity, so you get a super Keplerian gas flow here, and the pressure gradient on the outside mimics a lower gravity, so you get a sub Keplerian gas flow on the other side. And this combined uh, uh, wind here, uh, if you're a particle on the outside here, you get a headwind, you move in. If you're a particle on the inside, you get a tailwind and you move out. This can concentrate particles on very large scales of the turbulent flow. Um, this has been studied by many authors and, 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 and has been shown that this uh, concentrates particles that are maybe more like 10 centimeters or one meter or even 10 meters in the size. 
Now, what I will focus on in the talk today is a third mechanism called the streaming instability. And the streaming instability is a mechanism whereby the particles themselves take an active role in, in making the concentration. And, and I can illustrate that a little bit better on the next slide here, which shows how we envision the planetesimals formed by the streaming instability. We start with, with dust grains, um, like this IDP here, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this interplanetary dust particle here. They collide and stick together to form pebbles. And then we have the streaming instability that brings the pebbles into a dense filament. And how does it work? It works in such a way that if you have, uh, uh, if you have an isolated pebble here, it feels the headwind from the gas. It makes it move towards the, the star, as I've already demonstrated to you. But if you have more pebbles that are concentrated inside of, inside of a filament, then they can locally exert a drag force onto the gas. And they are pushing back on the gas. They're forcing the gas then to move at a speed that's closer to the capillarian speed. So the arrow here became shorter. When the gas doesn't have so much headwind, then the particles don't drift so fast, so there's a shorter arrow here. And then you can see that you get a runaway process whereby fast-moving particles from the outside come in and feed into the filament and make the filament denser and denser and denser. And then the filament at some point doesn't react to the gas anymore. It's just standing completely still like a cobweb capturing anything which comes inside. Yeah. This is an actual simulation of the streaming instability that we presented in a paper from 2015, where you see the filament which has formed here. We've also turned on the gravity between all the pebbles there. And now since there are so many pebbles coming close to each other, you can have sort of a gravitational instability that uh, makes the filament contract to form, pebble, to form planetesimals with a wide range of, of sizes here. Now the typical planetesimals, like what I'm pointing at here, is 100 kilometers in size. Uh, and this is very characteristic of the, of the typical size in the asteroid belt also. So we go directly from a millimeter, a centimeter up to 100 kilometers. But we form planetesimals with a wide range of sizes. We also form uh, planetesimals that are more like 10 kilometers in size, like this little dot here, which is sort of like, uh, like, like a small comet which we observe in the solar system. And we even uh, observe, you may almost be able to see that there are two planetesimals orbiting around each other here. Sometimes we uh, form binary planetesimals, so two planetesimals that are orbiting around each other. Now, if you go to the asteroid belt, there are not that many binaries, but the asteroid belt has also been highly collisionally and, 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 and gravitationally evolved. But if you go to the Kuiper belt in the outer solar system, you have many binaries such as this one, which is an artist's impression of a binary planetesimal in the Kuiper belt. Yeah. So um, by studying binary planetesimals in the Kuiper belt, one can then compare that to the outcome of streaming instability simulations which was, was done by uh, this Vaughan et al. in, uh, in uh, 2019, in this paper here, which came out in Nature Astronomy this year. So they uh, looked at the statistics of the binary orbits in, in the classical cold Kuiper belt. So this is the most pristine part of the Kuiper belt. And the orbits can orbit around each other in the same way as the orbit around the sun. This is called prograde, which is sitting along this axis here, or exactly the opposite way as the orbit around the sun, which is retrograde, sitting along this, this axis. Or the axis of rotation can sit in any angle uh, between completely prograde and completely retrograde. So people have done more and more measurements now of KBO binaries, and this is the result now that most of the KBO binaries observed are actually orbiting prograde. It's like, like the Earth is, is, is rotating around its own axis in the same way as it rotates around the Sun. A lot of these binaries are orbiting around each other in the same direction as they orbit around the, the Sun. And this could be a primordial fingerprint of their formation. Um, so we see here, if you look at the cumulative plot as a function of binary separation, the cumulative plot here shows that so this is the, 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 the dashed line here. There's something like 80% of all the, the binaries in the Kuiper belt are orbiting prograde, and maybe 20, only 20% uh, uh, retrograde. So in this morning, in 2019, they did a streaming instability simulation, and they measured a lot of clumps. They look at the rotation of the clumps. They, uh, they collapse the clumps in a separate n-body simulation into a binary, and they found an extremely good match to this. Their match is the black line here. Believe it or not, it sits almost exactly on top of that dashed line. Yeah, so that the binaries that are formed by the streaming instability have orbits that are extremely similar to what we observe in the in the in the in the Kuiper belt. And as I said this is also something that we had seen before in our paper from 2015, where we saw a few binaries form, forming also, and we also observed that they are predominantly the uh, 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 prograde. Yeah. So this was published in Nature Astronomy and even came on on the cover of Nature Astronomy. And I guess what they say is, if it's in Nature, it's either interesting or or wrong. <laughs> so let's hope that this is one of the things that will actually turn out to be correct. <laughs> um, 
Maybe you also know about uh, MU69 that was visited by the New Horizons missions after New Year. It, it, a few days ago, it got a proper name, Arrokoth, which I think is actually a very nice name. And it looks a lot like it's a collapsed binary because uh, to get these two components together, you have to collide at a really, really uh, low speed. And if you take some of the binaries that are formed here and you somehow raise the eccentricity enough that they will, the two components will, will, will collide, they are going to collide at about a meter per second or something, which is completely in agreement with the structures which we're seeing here. So some evidence from the solar system there uh, for planetismal formation by the streaming instability. Okay. Now there's another piece of evidence one can look at is that one can look a little bit more detail at the, uh, at the mass uh, distribution of the planetismals that form. And one can measure something called the initial mass function, which is basically how many planetismals of different masses form uh, as a function of the mass. Yeah? So these are some simulations, uh, some results from our 2015 paper. And I'm presenting here three uh, different resolution simulations, a low resolution and a high resolution and a very high resolution simulation. This was a convergence test, so we wanted to compare what happens at different resolutions. Now, when we run at low resolution, we form four planetismals, the yellow ones here. You see the masses here, you see the radii here, they're sort of 200 kilometers in, 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 in size. And this is the, the differential ma mass function here. So you see that uh, you cannot really, uh, uh, we, we, we have four bodies, but we want to fit a power law to this, but we can't really fit a power law to only four bodies. You, get, you can get very different results out then. So we run at a higher resolution, and nicely we form again four large planetesimals, showing a sort of a converged simulation, but we form more and more small planetesimals. And when we run at very high, high, high resolution, so this was a simulation that ran on 4,000 computational cores for three months, then we get a lot of small planetesimals forming and the same number of large planetesimals. Yeah? So then we can fit a power law into it and we get something like the NDM going as m to minus 1.6. It's very nice that a year later, the Boulder Group, uh, that also presented the Nature Astronomy paper this year, they did a similar experiment with their Athena code, we did this with the pencil code, and they got a very similar power law. So it's very uh, comforting that you see that they got the, the same result. It's an interesting mass function here because actually most of the mass resides in the largest planetesimals. If you want to see where the mass is sitting, you have to multiply it by m squared in order to, uh, to find out where most of the mass is sitting, then this becomes positive. So the, most of the mass is sitting here. Most of the mass goes into the few largest bodies. But most of the number, uh, which is actually what we're seeing here, is the number is dominated by the small planetesimals. So when we go to higher and higher resolution, we form more and more small planetesimals, but they have almost no total mass in them. So it's a very top-heavy uh, initial mass function. The characteristic planetesimal size is 100 kilometers. That sort of fits nicely with the characteristic planetesimal size in the asteroid belt and in the Kuiper belt. And I should also say uh, we've done simulations later where we had uh, a lot much larger box sizes and we could probe what happens here, the largest masses, and it does seem that it turns over at some point that there's an exponential concatenation here so that you don't form any, any extremely massive planetesimals. You only form up to 200 kilometers or a little bit larger. There's also been some experiments now recently presented in 2019 where people have looked more at the small body population at higher resolution and there's some indication this could be turning over also. So it's not entirely clear yet to how far down the power law goes or how far up it goes, but it does seem to be, to be turning over in both uh, directions. Okay. So that was the initial mass function. As I said, the good news here is that it, 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 it fits kind of nicely with the, with the, with the asteroid build and with the Kuiper build. Okay. Now, I should talk a little bit about more about what are the conditions for making this work, uh, since the streaming instability does not make particle filaments under all conditions. That was something that we studied in detail uh, with a PhD student, uh, uh, Daniel Carrera, in his PhD thesis from 2015. And what Daniel did was he ran for a number of Stokes numbers. So the Stokes number is sort of like the particle size in meters. So this is sort of millimeter, centimeter, 10 centimeters, uh, one meter, 10 meters here. He measured what is the uh, concentration of, of pebbles in the gas that you need to reach in order for the streaming instability to make a dense filament that can make planetesimals. Uh, so the uh, canonical dust to gas ratio is sort of 1%. That's what the amount of dust we get in the interstellar medium and also what we get in, in, in the protoplanetary disk. And we see whenever we ran this at 1%, this is in the red region here, we did not find any filaments at all. Yeah, the streaming instability did not make any filaments and we did not form any planetesimals. Only in the, in the, in the green region here did, did, did we form uh, uh, filaments. So you see that the, that the metallicity has to be elevated above the kind of canonical 1% in order to get into the green region where the streaming instability can make filaments. Yeah. We see that the criterion is lowest around a sweet spot of Stokes number of 0.1. 
and that's around here, then I translate it into one centimeter at 10 AU approximately, and then it goes up on both sides. The, the, it's harder with smaller particles and it's harder with the larger particles. But this particle size is completely in agreement with what we observe around protoplanetary disks. I also say that the threshold depends on the radial pressure support. Okay. But well, then comes the question, if we want to form planetesimals by the swimming stability, we have to move from where we are. Maybe we are sitting in this, uh, in this uh, 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 red zone uh, uh, nominally uh, with the nominal dust to gas ratio and the nominal particle sizes. And somehow we have to move into the green zone. Yeah? And in order to increase the metallicity, we can do two things. Either we can remove gas. If you remove gas, then the, the remaining mass fraction of uh, pebbles in the gas becomes higher. Or we can move the pebbles around and pile them up in certain regions so that there's more pebbles in other regions than, 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 than in uh, some regions. Okay, so we can start by removing gas, uh, and this is actually not so hard. Uh, you can remove gas by the photons from the star. So the photons from the star can come in and, uh, and heat the gas and, and, and remove some of the gas, and then they leave the dust behind. This is what astronomers call photo evaporation. And people do a very complicated photo evaporation model to understand how the protoplanetary disk gets photo evaporated by the stellar photons. So one of the people working on that is Uma Gotti, uh, and she has presented these kind of models here where she measures uh, at this, a protoplanetary disk at this for three million years. She measures the mass of the dust as a function of time. And while the dust is getting accreted onto the star together with the gas, the gas is also getting photo evaporated. So as a function of time, you see at the three million years when the gas is gone, there's still something like 50 to 100 Earth masses of pebbles left. So basically the gas is photo evaporated and the dust is left behind. But this is good news because when you move the gas and you leave the dust, then you can increase the, the what the astronomers call metallicity, so the mass loading of the dust and the pebbles in the gas, and then you can somehow trigger the streaming instability. So that's what we did in this paper with Daniel Carrera in 2017, together with Uma Gotti, that we included a prescription for forming planetesimals by the streaming instability. And that's what we see here. So I should say the different colors here are particles of different sizes, so large pebbles down to, down, down to dust. You see, in the end, we left this... 50 to 100 Earth masses of dust. But when we, when we include a prescription for the streaming instability, basically this prescription here, then you see all this dust is then turned into planetesimals. And then at the end of the protoplanetary lifetime, we have almost no dust left, or we have a lot of planetesimals left. So this is a very good way of making a lot of planetesimals. The bad news is that it happens at a rather strange place, and it happens a little bit late. So if you look at where the planetesimals form here as a function of the distance from the star, so this is the mass in planetesimals, this is the distance from the star, you see that early on, after 2 million years, all the planetesimals has formed outside of 300 AU. That's really far away from the star. But this is where the gas is photo evaporated by FUV photons. And it's only uh, with time uh, approaching the, the, the final photo evaporation that the planetesimal uh, front moves in. So we see if I can find out where the purple is. The green and the purple. Yeah, okay. So you can see all the lines here. With time, we're going in. We're forming into a few 10 AU. And only in the last gasp of the, when the last gas is removed in the protoplanetary disk by X ray photo evaporation, do we form something like a few Earth masses of planetesimals in the 1 to 10 a, AU region. So this is maybe good if you want to form terrestrial planets. Uh, you have enough planetesimals there to form terrestrial planets. And if you want to deliver some dust to the debris disk, but it's a little bit of a problem if you want to form super-Earth or you want to form uh, a gas giant planets that accrete a lot of gas from the protoplanetary disk, that these planetesimals, they form too late to, to, uh, to, become, uh, to, to form the cores of gas giants or the cores of super-Earth. So another possibility for forming, forming planetesimals early is not photo evaporation, but that is the pile-up of dust and ice around, uh, around ice lines. So there's a lot of ongoing work on understanding planetesimal formation around, uh, around ice lines. There's some early work that we did in my group in 2013, where we showed that around the water ice line, so now here we are two, three astronomical units from the, from the sun, around the water ice line, this is where there's water is in the vapor form on the one side, and on the other side it's cold enough for water to be ice. Uh, you get a diffusive process whereby the, the water keeps diffusing over the ice line and then making the pebbles outside grow to larger and larger sizes simply by, by ice condensation. Yeah. This model was, uh, was followed up by other groups uh, a couple of years ago where people realized that not only do you form larger pebbles outside of the ice line, you also get a pileup of pebbles, actually. And a pileup is what we needed in order to trigger the streaming instability. Right? So you see here, this is a plot from, from uh, Draskovsky and Alibert 2017. That's their model here. That you start out with a, with a solar nebula that has the, an ice line here. On the outside, you have silicate pebbles and you have icy pebbles. 
on the inside you have silicate papers and your water vapor, then the ice sits as, uh, as uh, uh, rims on the uh, silicate papers, the, the silicate and the ice comes in with the radial drift, and then the diffusion of ice back over the water vapor, back over the ice line makes a little bit of, of a, of a pileup of icy particles out, outside of the water ice line. So this way the water ice line would be a good place to form planetismals early that could more drive the formation of, of, a, of a giant planet. Yeah. So maybe a planetismal is formed both in an early and a late generation. Okay, now let me link that up to the exoplanets. So now we talked about going from dust to planetismals, now we want to go from planetismals to planets. And when we don't even don't just know about the planets in the solar system, today we know of, of, of actually more than 4,000 exoplanets orbiting around other stars. Now uh, this plot here shows you, uh, let me zoom in on it, shows you some of those exoplanets that have been discovered in the last 25 years. It shows the orbital distance in astronomical units, and here's the planetary mass in, 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 in Earth masses. And you can see that, that exoplanets are basically filling out the entire uh, uh, space here. But let me go through some of the categories which we find. We find uh, a category here around 1 to 10 Earth masses between point of 0.01 and point of few AU, where there are many planets that we call super-Earth. So they're sort of like Earth, but they're more massive than Earth. They're maybe between 2 and 10 Earth masses. Uh, and, uh, and they often contain gaseous envelopes, so they have accreted gas from the, from the, from the protoplanetoides. Then you get uh, uh, hot gas giants here. These are the same mass as, as Jupiter, so, so, uh, so about 300 Earth masses, or maybe between 100 and 1,000 Earth masses, but they're orbiting much closer to their host stars. Uh, this is a category of planets we don't have in the solar system at all. Then uh, exoplanet detection techniques are starting to probe into the cold gas giant territory here. So cold gas giants for me are like Jupiter and Saturn, that are gas giants orbiting far away from, from the star. You see Jupiter and, and, and Saturn marked here. And, and then you see that you're starting to have an empty region here, and that has to do with the fact that, you, that the orbits of something outside of 10 AU is so long that in order to find the, these planets, you need to follow them over a whole orbit, and it simply takes a very long time for an exoplanet survey. Ice giants, Uranus and Neptune are like gas giants, but less massive. They are very hard to find. We almost have no analogs of these around other stars. And finally, of course, terrestrial planets, more like Venus and Earth sitting at, at one AU. We have a few examples of terrestrial mass planets uh, around other stars, but not so many yet. Okay. But the point I wanted to make about this is if you look at these five categories of planets, actually four of them have accreted gas from, from the protoplanetary disk. Super-Earth, hot gas giants, cold gas giants, ice giants, they all have hydrogen and helium from the protoplanetary disk. Uh, they are very common around other stars, particularly super-Earth. This is showing the distribution here of, this is the number of uh, planets per star as a function of the, of the planet size. And you can see that the, that the planets between one and two, three Earth radii are by far the dominant planet around other stars. They're very common. Uh, and overall, we learn from this that most planets that create gas from the protoplanetary disk and therefore planets must form early, except possibly terrestrial planets. All other planetary classes seem to must to it, that they must form early. Okay, so how does that work? Well, in the classical core accretion scenario for forming a gas giant, for example, and this is very similar to how you would form a super-Earth also, you start with dust grains and ice particles that form kilometer-sized planetesimals. Then uh, you get a runaway accretion of one of these planetesimals to form a massive protoplanet. Uh, this protoplanet is then accreting planetesimals and it has a gaseous envelope It accretes the gas from the protoplanetary disk. And once the envelope mass becomes comparable to the core mass, uh, then you, you get a transition from something with a small envelope to something with a massive envelope like, like uh, Jupiter here. Yeah? Um, so then you form a gas giant with a core of maybe 10 Earth masses and an atmosphere of, 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 of several hundred, uh, hundred Earth masses. Uh, Jupiter mass. And, and the key thing here is all these steps must happen within one to three million years while there's still gas left orbiting the star. After a few million years, the protoplanetary gas disk goes away by photoevaporation and by accretion onto the star. Yeah. So you've got, to do, you've got to form the core fast. Now, traditionally, people have formed the core via planetesimal accretion, so there was a core and a group by accreting planetesimals. The problem with this process is that it's very inefficient, and I can illustrate why it is inefficient here. This is an illustration of a protoplanet sitting in the middle here. There's the blue dot here. And it has a hill radius around, and the hill radius is the distance over which the protoplanets can capture uh, something that comes in on a Keplerian orbit that's either closer to the star or further away from the star. Uh, so this is the, the region where the protoplanet gravity dominates over that of the star. So a planetesimal coming in here uh, on, a, on, a, on an interior orbit 
will be scattered by the protoplanet. It will certainly feel the gravity from the protoplanet, but it doesn't mean that it's accreted. Most of the planetesimals are actually simply scattered. Actually, it's less than one in a thousand uh, planetesimals that are accreted onto the, onto the protoplanet. So it's a very inefficient process. Now, if you go back to the protoplanet that is filled with pebbles, we can also then consider the accretion of pebbles instead. And it turns out that this is far more efficient, and that is because the pebble feels friction. So if we replace the, um, the planetesimal now by a pebble, the, the pebble comes in, and when it starts to move relative to the gas, then it feels a very strong friction onto it. The friction drains kinetic energy from the pebble, and that means that the pebble at some point becomes gravitationally bound to the protoplanet and has no choice but to go and spiral in and collide with the protoplanet. So this way, the pebble can be accreted from a much larger uh, range of, of, of orbits than the, uh, than the planetesimal can. So you can get very, very high pebble accretion rates. Um, here is an illustration from our paper in 2012 on the time it takes to build up a core of 10 Earth masses as a function of the distance from the star. And this is, uh, if you do use the traditional planetesimal accretion formulations, you can sort of do it in 1 to 10 million years, which is the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk, within 1 AU. Uh, and if you do it with pebbles, you can actually, uh, even out to 100 AU, there's enough time to uh, grow a 10 Earth mass core within the lifetime of, of the protoplanetary disk. So with pebble accretion, it's possible to form solid cores of 10 Earth mass planets before the gaseous protoplanetary disk is accreted after a few million years. Now, uh, pebble accretion is very fast. I'm going to show you in a few slides from now how we can form various kinds of planets using pebble accretion. But an important thing also, we need to stop pebble accretion at some point and start accreting a gaseous envelope. While pebbles are being accreted, they release so much gravitational energy that the envelope is so hot that it cannot contract in any kind of way, and then you cannot form gas giants. So we need to stop pebble accretion also. And luckily, there's a mechanism for stopping pebble accretion, and that is as the planet is growing in mass, or the planetary core from one Earth mass to 10 to 20 Earth masses, the, uh, it starts to perturb the pressure gradient of the protoplanetary disk. So this is the usual pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure in the gas. The gravity starts to perturb the pressure in such a way that there's a pressure bump forming on the outside of the orbit. And that pressure bump has the ability to stop the, the drift of pebbles uh, onto the star and stop the drift of pebbles onto the planet also. So when it grows to something like 20 Earth masses, the planet stops to accrete pebbles. And this is sort of nice because that sort of agrees with the core masses we know from the giant planet in, in the solar system. Yeah? So in our paper from 2014, we demonstrated that pebble accretion stops at what we call the pebble isolation mass, which is sort of 20 Earth masses for a nominal aspect ratio of the protoplanetary disk of uh, 0.05. And that is very dependent on the aspect ratio of the, of the protoplanetary disk. And then when we reach the pebble isolation mass, then the envelope will start to cool down, and then we can accrete gas from the protoplanetary disk. So this is an essential part of pebble accretion also, is stopping pebble accretion. Let me show you how that works. So these are some illustrations, by the way, from our annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences chapter that we published a couple of years ago, where we tried to do a pedagogical uh, 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 review of how pebble accretion works, and we also show all the equations, and we show uh, when you integrate them what kind of planetary formation pathways which you, uh, which you get. So we start out here, uh, we start out here uh, 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 planetesimal starting between 5 and 30 uh, astronomical units. And we want to see how they grow from 10 to minus 5 Earth masses, so that's sort of a few hundred kilometers in size. And we want to see how they're growing in the first plot here, just up to 0.1 Earth masses. So growing up to something like a mass mass. Yeah? And uh, the solid line, when the line is solid, it shows that the growth of the protoplanet is dominated by creating smaller planetesimals. That's kind of the classical view of how protoplanets grow. And when it becomes a thin line, then the growth is dominated by pebble accretion. So you see, in, in, at all these distances, you, you, you see that in the beginning, you're dominated by, uh, by accreting planetesimals onto the core until it reaches something like, like a moon mass, something like 0.01 Earth masses here, then it starts to be dominated by, by, pebble, by pebble accretion. I should also say that the small dots here separate 200,000 years, and the large dots, dots, dots here separate 1 million years. Also, see when you go out to 30 AU, you need several million years even to grow up a, 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 a mass mass uh, uh, protoplanet. Yeah? The, now we can continue then uh, to grow from, um, from uh, 10 to minus 2 Earth mass and moon mass and then up to actual planets here. And in this plot here, I'm then including the migration of the planets. And this is very important that planets migrate. Planets migrate because they are, uh, uh, they are interacting with the gas from the protoplanetary disk and the gas exerts a gravitational torque onto the planet. So as the planets are growing larger, they start to, uh, to migrate. And you can say here, if we want to form something like Jupiter, we can take our 5, Earth, five AU track here. We can continue it here. 
And you see, in a few hundred thousand years, we grow up to a core mass of, of uh, so where are we now? It can be hard to see. We are here. So we go up to 10 Earth mass uh, core, and then we stop pebble accretion, we pebble isolation mass, we start to accrete gas, and we end up with something like 300 Earth masses, which is a perfect Jupiter analog. But you also see the problem with this is that it migrated into zero AU, basically. While it was growing, it was migrating in, and it actually became a, a hot Jupiter. Now, we don't have a hot Jupiter in the solar system. We have it around other stars, and this is maybe a pathway to form hot Jupiters. But because of migration, then we need to form Jupiter further out. So we can start out here at 15 AU instead. Jupiter is called and grows, and it, um, it reaches pebble isolation mass actually at, at something like 13, 14 AU. And then while it's accreting gas, then it's migrating into 5 AU. Yeah? So to get Jupiter ending at 5 AU, you need to start at 16 AU, and so on. Uh, we can make Saturn analogs also. And if we start sufficiently far out, uh, we, we don't really accrete a lot of gas, and you get something that is like Uranus and, uh, and uh, Neptune. Yeah? Um, so giant planets ending in cold orbits, so orbits outside of a few AU, they must start beyond 15 AU in the disk. Uh, and, and overall here, the overall good news is that rapid pebble accretion can explain how planets remain in the protoplanetary disk despite planetary migration, because pebble accretion is so fast that we can form the planets further out. Then they have a longer distance to migrate over. Yeah, and then migration suddenly becomes something that is consistent with the observations. I just want to highlight a study that we did this year, actually, on seeing if we can find any evidence that Jupiter migrated. Maybe Jupiter migrated in the solar system. We find that Jupiter should have formed out in this 2030 AU region, but it's now at 5 AU. And actually, we found some evidence from the Trojans. So Jupiter has a stable, so this is the asteroid belt here. Here's Jupiter. Jupiter has two stable populations of, of asteroids trailing the uh, Jupiter and being ahead of Jupiter. And they are trapped in two stable Lagrange points uh, that are... That are, that are sitting in the same distance as Jupiter, but are sitting uh, 60, 60, 60 degrees behind and 60 degrees ahead of uh, Jupiter. Yeah. The strange thing that is observed is that the leading population here is actually 1.6 times more populated than the trailing population. No one really understands why there will be 1.6 times more bodies in the leading than in the trailing uh, Trojan population. Uh, so, but when we try with pebble accretion models, then we start to uh, form Jupiter out in the 2030 AU region. Uh, and then we can see uh, in, in this plot here that we have all the four, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Maybe I'm sure it'll be better here. We have the four giant planets forming here. We put planetesimals everywhere and we make Jupiter formed by pebble accretion and migration. You can see in the end Jupiter ends at 5 AU and, and, and Saturn ends at, ends at, at, at 8 AU. And you can see in the process of going in, Jupiter scatters a lot of the planetesimals and so does Saturn and Uranus and, 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 and Neptune. Some of them are scattered into the asteroid belt, some of them are, are scattered out to the Kuiper belt. And you see the, that these optics that are sitting in the same orbit as Jupiter and the same as Saturn here, these are Trojans. So on the way migrating in, Jupiter also captures these Trojans and then it migrates together with the Trojans. It brings the Trojans from its formation region all the way into 5 AU. Yeah. And the nice thing is that as a function of the, the migration pathway, so here are long migration pathway, short migration pathway, we see that we get the asymmetry, 1.6, almost exactly spot on, when Jupiter has migrated more than a few AU, more than three AU or something, we get a nice asymmetry, you get more leading Trojans and then trailing Trojans, and when, what, on the other hand, if Jupiter didn't migrate at all, if it formed at five AU, there would be no asymmetry at all. Yeah? So we think that the asymmetry in the Trojans is actually a primordial fingerprint that Jupiter found, found, found far further out than uh, where it is today. We also did an experiment where we did uh, let Jupiter migrate outwards, then you get the opposite asymmetry. So we think that's a clear evidence that Jupiter did not migrate outwards. Um, and finally, I would say that, that uh, it's interesting that Jupiter's Trojans and Neptune's Trojans that are sitting here, they are also observed today, they have almost the same color. And it's interesting with Neptune being at 30 AU and Jupiter's Trojans having the same color. It's another indication that Jupiter probably captures its Trojans very far away from, from the Sun and that the Trojan population of Jupiter actually is probing uh, the formation material of uh, Jupiter that existed far away from the Sun four and a half billion, billion years ago. Yep. And this is published in these two papers from 2019. So some evidence there that Jupiter did migrate. Okay. But let's uh, go into the inner solar system and see if we can form some terrestrial planets and some super Earth. So these are the planets that exist in the inner part of the of of, of the of the solar systems. So these are showing growth tracks of terrestrial planets and 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 super Earth. And here we start uh, planets here at 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 uh, at uh, point five and one and two and three AU. And again, we are dominated by planetesimal accretion early on. After ten to minus three Earth masses by pebble accretion. Then I marked one Earth mass here, and you can see, so these dots here mark 200,000 years. 
these protoplanets, they grow past one Earth mass in, in a few hundred thousand years, so it's very hard to stop them at terrestrial planet masses, actually. It's much easier to make them continue to grow and migrate and then reach pebble isolation mass at a few Earth masses here. Since the disk is cold or close to the star, the pebble isolation mass is much lower. That means that the gas accretion rate is also much, much lower. That means that you can get just a little bit of gas accretion onto these planets, and it looks a lot like super-Earth that we observe around other stars that are maybe five, ten Earth masses, and then with a few Earth masses of gas at most. Yeah? Um, so we formed super-Earth with gaseous envelopes. So it's a bit of a, it's very interesting for forming super-Earth. It's not so hard to form super-Earth, actually. You can do it this way. They are forming, they are migrating, they are creating gas. It's a little bit harder to form in terrestrial planets. A, question number one is, why, don't we, why didn't this happen in the solar system? And question number two is, how do terrestrial planets form at all? And one possibility is that maybe Jupiter blocked the inflow of, of, of pebbles. When Jupiter formed, the inflow of pebbles was stopping, and maybe that was quenching the growth here around Mars-sized embryo or moon-sized embryo in the solar system. I can show uh, a little bit more uh, uh, details of how to form super-Earth and terrestrial planets. We've done a similar experiment as this one, but now in actual in-body simulations where the protoplanets feel each other's gravity. So this was published in, uh, in Lamplex in 2019. And here we start a lot of protoplanets out at, 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 at from 0.5 to a few AU, and we let them we let them uh, grow and, and migrate while they are aware of each other's gravity. And this becomes very important, actually. Then we experiment with different pebble drift rates. Uh, so this is, these are numerical experiments. We take a nominal pebble drift rate of 100 Earth masses per mega year. So typical protoplanetary disk, they have 1,000 Earth masses of pebbles to begin with. And uh, these 1,000 uh, Earth masses drift uh, towards the star in something like 3 million years. So we say, so this may be even a little bit low. Maybe it could be even several hundred Earth masses of pebbles. But if we take a nominal rate of 100 Earth masses per mega year, and we, that's the blue simulation here, you see exactly what I, what I said before, that if you have a low pebble rate, drift rate, then you get stuck at, after 3 million years at mass-sized embryos that have not interacted gravitationally in any kind of way. So this is the situation after 3 million years. There's the blue one here. And then you see if you then run it for 100 million years, you form Earth and Venus analogs and even Mars analogs. And this is sort of classical terrestrial planet formation that the Earth formed from the collision of a number of mass-sized or mass-mass embryos. So that's what you get when you get a low pebble flux, the Earth formed by giant impacts. Um, if you go to a little bit higher pebble flux, now we increase the pebble flux by a factor of five-thirds, up to something like 150, you get something completely different out. After three million years, instead of having a mass-sized embryo, you have super-Earths. You have many of them. They have gaseous envelopes. And then what's really interesting, so this is five-thirds, this is the red one, is three times the pebble flux. Then you get a lot of very giant impacts, not just mass mass giant impacts, but you get really two, three Earth mass planets colliding with each other. And in the end, you get something uh, as, as systems of super Earth that have between five and ten uh, Earth masses, and it looks very similar to what we saw, what we saw around other stars. Yeah? So, this way, the formation of super Earth and the formation of terrestrial planets are actually connected processes. A low pebble flux, you, you, get, you get terrestrial planets through classical terrestrial planet formation, and if you go to a higher pebble flux, then you actually form uh, super-Earths that are very similar to, uh, to those uh, the, which you observe around other stars. And again, why would you have a low pebble flux around uh, the Sun? Maybe Jupiter again. When Jupiter somehow reached pebble isolation mass at some point, it was blocking the flow of pebbles into the inner solar system, and maybe that's the reason why we have terrestrial planets here and we don't have super-Earths. Yeah. Uh, I should also say that a lot of these a lot of these embryos here are orbiting in in, in resonances. So when when the orbits are integer ratios of each other, which we don't observe uh, in, in in any super, it's not so common in super Earth system to have to have uh, to have uh, to have resonances. But actually, after the giant impacts that arise here, these resonances are basically washed out. So uh, people have used the lack of resonances as an evidence against this kind of picture, but we think that actually it got destroyed by, by this late instability and the giant impacts. Okay. Okay, I'm coming almost to the end. Just want to show one slide about what happens when we go to even higher pebble fluxes. When we go, we have the nominal pebble fluxes here, we form super Earth. So this is a paper by Bitchidel in 2019. Uh, when we go to this end body simulation again, when we do uh, medium or, or, or low pebble fluxes, we form super Earth systems here. And when we increase the pebble flux, we suddenly start to form systems of uh, giant planets, many, many giant planets. And it seems that there's a very uh, sharp transition in, 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 in the pebble flux from forming super Earth to forming uh, giant planets. And we think that this agrees well with these kind of measurements from, 
from exoplanet populations. That's, uh, if you take here the, the radius of the planet, and this is the metallicity of the host star. So zero is the solar amount of, of, of heavy elements, and, and, and positive is supersolar, and, and negative is subsolar. You see that the giant planets that are with more than four uh, uh, Earth radii here, they're mainly orbiting around stars that are supersolar metallicity, so more heavy element rich than, 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 than the sun. And we think that is this transition that we're seeing in these simulations also. Um, and uh, some of them even undergo instability to yield eccentric orbits. You see some of them have actually become, become unstable. Um, and, and then observations show that giant planets are far more common around stars that are rich in, in, in heavy elements, and we get uh, a very good agreement with that from uh, theory also. Okay, so that was a quick walk through uh, planet formation theory, all the way from dust, all the way up to planetary systems. Uh, and I just want to quickly summarize my talk. One thing we learned from studying protoplanetary disks is that they are really good pebble factories, so it's very easy to get from there to there. From there to there, we probably need the streaming instability or something else to uh, concentrate particles. Uh, in, uh, that can then collapse under that gravity to form planetesimals with a characteristic size of 100 kilometers. The streaming instability is a very good mechanism for that. It can explain the prograde planetesimal orbits in the Kuiper very good agreement, and also a good agreement with the initial mass function. Then in order to get from here to here, we probably need some rapid pebble accretion uh, to explain how, how gas giants can before, form before gas dissipation, and also to explain how super-Earth systems can form. And finally, I, I, I highlighted this interesting fact that terrestrial planet formation and super-Earth formation may be connected processes that are determined entirely by the amount of pebbles that are available to form, form the planetary system. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. It's time for questions and comments. Here we go. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have a very, uh, first a very stupid question. So what happened to the pebbles? Now, if you look at the chondrite, you have uh, undifferentiated materials, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I didn't talk about chondrules here at all. Uh, for, in my perspective, chondrules are pebbles. Uh, we've done models together with Martin Pissarro in Copenhagen where, where we considered uh, the, 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 the growth of planetary bodies by creating chondrules. It's very, very efficient. But the only thing I don't know is, I think the difference for me between a cosmochemical chondrule and an astrophysical pebble is that the chondrules have clearly been, been heated and melted and then recrystallized. Well, next question. So do they, do they, are they melted, these pebbles? Sorry, what did you say? Are they melted? When you when you form them? No, they're not melting. They, I, I don't know how to form chondrules. I wish I, wish I knew. I, I would like contours to be melted dust aggregates somehow so that they are pebbles. How you heat them to 1500 Kelvin or 2000 Kelvin and then cool them again and what environment, uh, I don't know. Uh, but certainly if, if, there if there are contours forming in many kinds of protoplanetary disks, they are very good at, at forming planetesimals and, and, and also good for pebble accretion. Okay, I don't know. Can I ask another one? And so, when, so you explain that uh, when you have this pebble accretion, to explain that, I think, for the giant planets, yeah. uh, you heat, uh, you heat, increase the temperature. Yeah. Uh, do you melt? Uh, would you melt the, the planet? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, especially, I mean, I'm not more interested for the planetesimal formation than for right. the uh, uh, yeah. giant no. planet in that case, but it, maybe it's the same. No, it's entirely, there, there's a different, there's a, there's a important difference between a, a, a a core growing by creating planetesimals, like this one coming in, and then a core growing by creating pebbles, that the pebbles are much easier to destroy. So probably uh, the pebble will never reach, reach, reach the core. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come in towards the core. It's going to get hotter and hotter. It's going to lose the volatiles first, CO, water, and so on. Then the silicate part, even the silicate part, will sublimate off at some point. And probably this whole picture of a solid core is extremely oversimplified. What you get in pebble, in pebble accretion is, is actually a vapor blob. So something that is a hundred or even a thousand times larger than the solid core consisting of silicate vapor, of water vapor, of all kinds of vapors that are mixed together. People are starting to look into that, what that means in terms of the planetary structure and in terms of the accretion processes and so on. It doesn't mean that you don't form planets this way, you can still form a planet, but then you need some cooling afterwards to get this vapor blob to consolidate into a solid object. There's also some, I say there's some indication that Jupiter's core is not like that at all, but actually that Jupiter's core from the Juno mission seems to fill half of Jupiter's radius. So the heavy elements are probably not concentrated in a core, it's probably concentrated in half Jupiter, which I think is agreeing with this picture that, that everything was just a big vapor soup early on. 
Julien So you have you have very fast uh, uh, terrestrial planet growth in, yeah. in your model. Yeah. So how does this reconcile with the, the dating of, um, of by by uh, for instance the right. Afium tungsten system right. of uh, terrestrial planets, which is much longer in, in yeah. general? Yeah. I would say for well we, we don't have to have it. So this paper so so Morby is one of the co-authors of this paper, and of course he he does not want to destroy tr classical terrestrial planet formation. So it still sits in here, right? That there is this this one here. You go out to point one, Earth mass is fast in the blue case here. Then you are left with mass size embryo when the gas goes away. Then they collide with each other over 100 million years. So, so you do have a classical terrestrial planet formation there that can be consistent with half Newton tungsten ages and with the uh, moon formation. But I, I, I think there is a room for classical terrestrial planet formation there. But I would also say if I observe a one Earth mass planet around another star, how do I know if it's formed by the blue mechanism or if it's formed by pebble accretion going up to one Earth mass? I, I, I think there must be two kinds of one Earth mass planets out there. There must be ones that are similar to what we believe happen in the solar system, and there must be ones that form very, very rapidly. Uh, and the question is then, uh, how much evidence do we really have in the solar system for one or the other? I don't know entirely. But I would still say that there must be two ways to form one Earth mass planet. And whether you only con maybe one of them is a small super Earth and the other one is, is a terrestrial planet. Uh, yeah. And, and the small super Earth would have a very, very old age and, 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 and the terrestrial planet would have, a, would have a, young, a young age, so to say. So uh, <clears throat> I understand that pebbles are really efficient to form kilometer sized yeah, yeah. Uh, objects, so yeah. it solves one problem of planet formation. Yeah. How do you form pebbles? What are the mechanisms in, involved in mm. pebble yeah. formation? Yeah. And yeah. can you get information from the ALMA images yeah, yeah. about this? Yeah. Okay, so what's believed is that it's simply micrometer sized dust grains that come together and, and, and they stick together when they collide. Then people have done experiments in the lab that show when you go to a millimeter this way it's efficient, but above a millimeter it doesn't work anymore. Things are, are just uh, bouncing instead. Right, so 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 this so so this is one possibility, that is just uh, micrometer-sized dust dust uh, dust aggregates that are come together, so to say, right? Uh, sorry. Why do they stick? Yeah, why, why do, do they stick? stick? They are sticking due to uh, surface forces. So uh, there there is a certain uh, there's a certain uh, co uh, cohesion even between uh, solid particles. It's very weak. Uh, so you need two things. You need to dissipate energy. I think it's a very good question, by the way. First of all, when things collide, you need to, to get rid of the kinetic energy. This can happen by rolling friction and so on, so there's a lot of ways to dissipate the kinetic energy. And then you need a certain sticking, and this is simply by being close enough together, there's a certain amount of, of, of cohesion, which is pretty weak. But if it's a lot of micrometer-sized particles that are sitting together, the, the combined cohesion can be rather strong. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but another version is to do it by, by ice condensation, that if you condense ice instead, then you get... Um, igneous, yeah. You 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 get crystalline uh, solids that are then of a much much higher strength. Uh, so there there are, there are there are these two pathways. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you know that in cosmochemistry, uh, a major observation is the preservation, the apparent preservation of two nucleosynthetic reservoirs. Right. Um, given what you just explained, would you say that if you have only pebble accretion, yeah. it's possible to preserve two reservoirs like that because you seem to have only a drift from outside to inside right. and in the classical terrestrial planet formation you have yeah. much more right. mixing could yeah. you comment i would comment on it i think sebastian knows a lot more about this than, than i do but uh, but but i think one of the pictures you could have there is actually that the protoplanet that is originally had a, had two nucleosynthetic fingerprints an inner and, and, and an outer fingerprint and the outer fingerprint came in later so maybe in the beginning when when, when the pebbles were drifting in they had the one fingerprint <laughs> And then what came from really far out, remember that the, the solar protoplanet that is does not have to be 30 AU, it could have been 200 AU in size, right? So something, maybe the other fingerprint was sitting out of 200 AU early on, and then it was only after a few million years that it came rushing in, so to say, and, and then left its imprint on the terrestrial planets. So I think it is consistent, but if you want to have two reservoirs, you better have a large protoplanet that is because otherwise you're going to run out of, the, the, the drift is so fast that, 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 that you can't keep the outer part out for, for several million years. But it, it, I think it's consistent with having a large protoplanetary disk 
And I think that, that Sebastian worked on a model also where you had a small disk early on and then it expands viscously. So that material starts firing and then it gets out and then it gets in again, right? much about my work, <laughs> but, <laughs> but just because, uh, but uh, yes, uh, yeah. it seems that uh, if you if you couple uh, the dynamics of the disk mm -hmm. with the dynamics of the info, yeah, right, right. uh, it may be possible that you prevent um, a lot, in fact, counterintuitively, uh, most of the material, in fact, that is preserved outward, come mm. from the inward mm. for, from because the disk initially right, right, right. expands. Right. And so in some condition, you can preserve that, yeah. this material. Yeah. Yeah. Just something, sorry, then I can give to, my, to Mark. Uh, and also, I mean, most of these isotopic, isotopic anomalies are with the matrix of mm. the chondrites, right, right. which are millimeter size, or, right. I mean, smaller, yeah. very yeah. thin, yeah. Much yeah. Yeah. micrometer size, micrometer size uh, yeah. uh, dust. Yeah. So these are clearly not pebbles. Uh, no, but they could see that rims on pebbles. So one possibility is that either there were dust aggregates made out of, of, of CI-like matrix, Something we discussed this morning at the breakfast that there may, maybe there were non non chondrule pebbles, so really dust aggregate pebbles coming in, or uh, chondrules from the outside could have had a, a coating of, of of CI matrix that that came in later. I guess you don't need a lot of it. Maybe ten percent of, of of a coating might be enough so that you bring the this in later. Yeah. Just to continue on that, so you you would not. Do you like so much this idea of having Jupiter uh, at one, uh, one million year at three AU to separate these two nucleosynthetic reservoirs as they, they call for it? Because in your model, you would make Jupiter very far away. Right. And it will, uh, at one million year, it would be uh, 15 AU away. Okay, and it will not. Uh, so it's this, this, this idea is in fact not, uh, seems to work with ants, but is, is not really working with I don't, I, I don't like the idea so much of having Jupiter at five AU because Jupiter has to migrate in my view. Uh, I think there's another view which has been proposed, I guess, by the Martin Pizarro group, is that, that, that you don't have to, just because you form early doesn't mean you accrete all the time. Maybe something forms early and then stops accreting. That can be you get, you get on a very eccentric orbit, so you stop accreting after a while, whereas planets like Mars and Earth are continuing to accrete even after several million years, and they are the ones that, are, that, that get the late nucleosynthetic fingerprints, so to say, whereas some of the chondrites that we observe to have only the early uh, contribution, they were maybe only accreting for a while and then, then they were stopping because they got on so eccentric, excited orbits that they couldn't accrete anymore. Um, maybe one last quick <laughs> question or comment somewhere there. Okay, let's. Hi. Oh. I wanted to say because it probably misunderstood, but I saw you show a plot when uh, you introduce uh, in streaming instability to form planetesimal from uh, dust particles with different sizes, yeah. we see at some point that, yeah, just after this one, uh, we see that at some point we have no more dust and small sizes grains when we have planetesimals, yeah. but yeah. then when we see evolution of uh, uh, growing uh, planetary, mm. you say that it's dominated first by planetesimal and then by the dust right. and... Right. So. Yeah, I guess that's a good question. You're asking why are we, no, we don't have anything left to accrete then. It's all, turn, it's all turn, turned into, into planetesimals. Uh, I think this has to do with the fact that you can see early on we do have it, right? If you go earlier, you have 50% planetesimal, 50% dust. I think it's more that later on you remove so much gas that the metallicity is so high that there's nothing left in, in the gas, basically. But it's a good point. I had like, appreciated that. That at the end here, you really have no pebbles left because it's all turned into planetesimal. So probably photo evaporation would be the end of pebble accretion also at some point because all the pebbles turn into planetesimals. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, should we stop here? Uh, then there is a buffet, so we can keep going with the discussion. And I'll suggest two thanks, Anders, once again. Thank you very much.